Thought it was reasonable to wait uh, Nusquinets or so, a few minutes for everybody to come in from lunch. I hope everybody had some great food. Yoke yoga yi, sedekat yuhan. Yoke yuh satini. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all today. Um, why was there no major Clinket American War? Explanations for relative peace in the late 19th century. Today I'd like to present on this historical question. Why was there no major war between Tlingit and the United States of America? First, I wanna make sure I clarify what I mean by this question. 
and then I'll offer a series of possible explanations or answers from a variety of historical perspectives that I hope will prove thought-provoking and help foster future dialogue. Before I begin, however, I would like to acknowledge and express my gratitude that I'm able to give this presentation today in Kachana'ak, the town commonly known as Wrangell, on the lands of the Shtakin Kwan, the Stikin people, in Sengeani, Klinket country. Uh, I believe it's also appropriate for me to briefly introduce myself. Peter Stanton, you had to wasak, singet kainach yachuch, you had to wasak, de ka ka washed on kwan, I had kitchunk ye had ye tea, ka ku at satu had city. My name is Peter Stanton, and in singet I was given the nickname yachuch or sea otter, um, ku and had kill. I'm a white American settler living in Ketchikan and I'm a social studies teacher at Ketchikan High School. And I should add that I, I really feel genuinely honored and humbled to be able to present at this conference for the first time and to do so alongside so many incredible knowledge bearers and scholars, many of whom I've admired from afar for years and years. I'm still very much a student of Singit Shagoon, Clinket history, and today's presentation is based on research that is definitely still in progress. I have a great deal more to learn and I welcome all corrections or feedback if I make any misstatements or misinterpretations. That said, I hope my presentation today will prove interesting and useful. So let's begin by looking at the historical context for this presentation. Throughout the 19th century and into the 20th, the United States government and American settlers made war against hundreds of distinct indigenous peoples across the North American continent, persecuting and killing many native people, dispossessing most indigenous nations of their homelands, and denying them their political and cultural independence. Most Americans should be broadly aware of those facts, although educators like me have a lot of work to do in order to make sure that new generations understand that history and its implications for us in the present. However, this broad story across North America of wars with so many different indigenous peoples does not fully apply to the history of Tsinge'ani, or Tlingit country. In Tsinge'ani, the US military did attack and dispossess Tlingit communities, but there was no extended war that took place between Tlingit and Americans. It's worth considering why that might have been the case. First, let's take a look at a select list I've made of so-called Indian wars that occurred between the US government, American settlers, and indigenous groups across the Great Plains, the Southwest, and the Intermountain West on lands that are today part of the United States. This partial list comes from only a period of little over two decades, from approximately 1867 to 1891, or from the US purchase of Alaska to the time of the infamous Wounded Knee Massacre, which occurred in 1890 during the Ghost Dance War. It should go without saying that there were many wars between the United States and indigenous peoples that occurred before 1867, and there continued to be extended violent conflicts even after Wounded Knee. The casualties from these wars ranged from a few dozen people killed, wounded, or displaced in some cases, to hundreds and even thousands of casualties and refugees in others. All of these conflicts involved multiple connected violent confrontations and required indigenous nations and smaller groups to organize armed resistance for weeks, months, years, and even decades in order to combat American settlers and the US government. For the Thinget, however, there was no equivalent conflict that could be placed in this same category. There was no case where any group of Thinget organized prolonged violent resistance to the United States, nothing that could be accurately called a war. As I say that, I do need to make crystal clear 
that the Sangit did resist American colonization in a variety of ways, some of them violent. They did face off against Americans in armed confrontations, and there were acts of violence that the U.S. military perpetrated against Sangit after the Alaska Purchase of 1867, most notably across central Sangit Ani in 1869 from Shitka, Sitka, to Kachana Auk, Wrangell, to the U.S. Army attacks on the Cake Kwan, or the Cake people in the so-called Cake War. And finally, in the U.S. Navy bombardment of Angoon, or Angoon in 1882, as historian Zachary Jones illuminated in his work, the Cake War was not a war, but a one-sided attack by the U.S. military to which there was no violent response. The same occurred in Wrangell and Angoon as well. I do not have time today to talk about each of these events in greater depth, and there are many scholars who have analyzed them in the detail they deserve, um, including in presentations at this conference, like Ronan Rooney's presentation this morning about the bombardment of Wrangell. For now, however, it is important to note that in spite of this violence, Sangit leaders never led clans into prolonged battles with the United States. In other words, the Sangit never chose to start a war with the Americans, even when, under most any conception of international law, the United States did launch violent attacks against Sangit that would have justified war. To maybe put this idea a little more creatively, there was no Sangit equivalent in the late 19th century to famed indigenous military leaders like the Apache leader Goyasle, commonly known as Geronimo, or the Modoc leader Kintpuash, commonly called Captain Jack. There were no large bloody confrontations like the Battle of the Greasy Grass, commonly called the Battle of the Little Bighorn, or scenes of slaughter like at Wounded Knee. The theme of this conference is Guwakon Gawu, or a time for peace. And I did use the term relative peace in the subtitle of my presentation. However, I do feel like I should further qualify my words and provide a contrast by using a famous quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. True peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. And to use Dr. King's definition, the late 19th century was absolutely not a time of true peace in Singa Ani. It was not even a time where there was a mere absence of tension. Instead, as all of us should be aware, the late 19th century was a time in which the United States colonized Tlingit Ani, denied Tlingit laws, exploited Tlingit lands, waters, and resources, and engaged in systematic campaigns to destroy Tlingit culture and society through forced assimilation. It's also important to note that even if no major war occurred, there were undoubtedly hundreds of Tlingit who died from violence as a result of colonization as well as hundreds and thousands lost to ongoing outbreaks of infectious diseases brought to the region by outsiders. As the Shoshone historian Ned Blackhawk writes, violence, quote, became intrinsic to American expansion, end quote. Few people, least of all Dr. King, would describe this time as peaceful, at least not without serious qualification. Nevertheless, Definitions of peace can vary widely, and when historians and political scientists define peace in a broader geopolitical view, they typically do so according to the absence or even just the low frequency of major wars. The Latin word pax, although translated as peace, refers more accurately to broad and prolonged political stability. For example, Major pieces that at least some historians propose to have occurred in world history include the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, the Pax Mongolica, or Mongol peace, the Pax Britannica, or British peace from the fall of Napoleon to World War I, and then the Pax Americana, or the American peace, which on the global scale may be defined as lasting from the end of World War II up to maybe the present day. In each of these cases, a major political or military power was able to exert control over a large region or even the whole world for an extended period of time, limiting or just disincentivizing groups or other states 
from going to war with each other within that sphere of influence. And in each of these cases, it was major wars and acts of destruction resulting in millions of deaths that were a large part leading up to what made such pieces possible. In the words of the Roman historian Tacitus, quote, they make a desert and call it peace, end quote. And during each of these so-called pieces, imperial powers were able to exploit millions of people, extracting their wealth and denying them political self-determination. Therefore, we have to be especially careful in how we define peace and note that the absence of wars in a place or time period has often coincided with exploitation and injustice. Another way historians might use that term Pax Americana would be to refer to how the United States influenced the limiting of major wars across North and South America starting in the late 19th century, well before the United States made a major impact on the global stage. As part of this concept, one could argue that the imposition of US sovereignty over indigenous peoples by the early 20th century created a Pax Americana on the North American continent. Again, this does not mean that there was justice or a lack of violence or tension, but rather that the actions of the United States created conditions under which major wars became extremely unlikely. So, after providing that context and qualification, I'll return to the central question of my presentation. Why did no major war occur between Sengit and the United States during the late 19th century? There are a number of possible explanations that could be considered, each of which could help us to at least partially answer the question. Here, I've chosen four explanations, although there are certainly many others. Uh, when I started developing this presentation, it was seven, eight, or nine, and then I slowly realized, I've only got an hour here, I've got to simplify and merge these explanations, and I, I settled on four, since it is also a significant number um, in Shingit culture. Um, I present these four explanations in order from the very broad to the particular, and the degree to which you find each of these explanations convincing may depend, at least in part, on your understanding of history. Do you believe that human history is most influenced by larger forces like geography and the environment, or by long-term trends in human society? Or do you believe that history hinges on specific events and actions taken by individuals? And you can consider those questions throughout this presentation. The potential answers I'll present to this question of why there was no major Clinkett American War are as follows. First, the geography of Shingeani and its distance from centers of American population and power. Second, the environment and natural resources of Shingeani. Third, the political independence and divided interests of different Shinget groups. And fourth, the specific decisions and compromises made by Tlingit and American individuals and Tlingit clans that avoided further violence. Those may seem like a lot of answers to a single question, or you may already be thinking of other potential answers as well, but history is complex, and determining what caused something to occur, let alone what caused something not to occur, can be a challenging and stubborn task. So with that in mind, as I discuss each of these explanations, I will also provide a variety of potential historical parallels and counterexamples, other events and patterns from history that may reinforce or cast doubt on whatever argument I'm presenting. It's not my intent here to propose a single definitive answer for the question of why there was no major Clinkett American War. Instead, I wanna provide you with a range of evidence and arguments to consider, and you can judge for yourselves what, explana what explanations are most convincing. Along with mentioning other examples from history to compare and contrast with the Shinget experience, I will also ask counterfactual questions to hopefully prompt some thinking about the most important causal factors in this history. 
clearly the study of history is not a science. And there's no way for us to look back into the past and run experiments that isolate different variables. However, if we ask some counterfactuals or what if questions, they can help us intellectually test, at least to some extent, the relative weight of different elements in this history. And if it isn't quite clear what I mean yet by that, I'll give examples soon. So let's begin. Let's start by examining the first of these arguments for why there was no major war between the Tlingit and the United States. One potential answer is geographic. The nature and location of the Tlingit homeland made it difficult and unlikely for the United States or even other uh, imperial powers in North America to attempt large colonization and settlement efforts that might have incentivized colonizers to make war or that might have led Tlingit to respond with war to defend their sovereignty. Tlingit did not meet any Europeans until 1741, when Alexei Cherikov's ship Svetopavl visited Tlingit Ani. That date is much later than when many other indigenous peoples in North America, and certainly those living in most coastal areas, encountered Europeans. And it must be primarily due to distance from Europe and the trade routes Europeans had developed until that time. Then, when other imperial powers sent expeditions to Tlingit-Ani in the late 18th century, including the Spanish, the British, and the French, the distances from their centers of power were still too great for them to maintain a substantial and prolonged colonial claim to Tlingit resources and territory. So I created this image on the right to illustrate how Tlingit-Ani was located thousands of miles away from any of the primary economic and population centers of the major imperial powers that might have wanted to colonize the region in the 18th century. Then, as the United States expanded in the 19th century, in large part based on the foundation of earlier European claims, Singa'ani still remained far away from the major routes of settlement and military conquest. It can also be argued that, aside from simply being a matter of geographic distance, the extreme landscape of the northwest coast of North America, and Singa'ani in particular, made European and American settlement difficult or unattractive compared with the gentler, more convenient, or more enticing geographies of areas like the Eastern Seaboard, the Great Lakes region, or the Great Plains that saw much more colonial settlement and wars between indigenous peoples and colonial powers. In contrast, the coast range and the fearsome North Pacific provide imposing obstacles for would-be intruders into Tlingit-Ani. Other extreme regions in the Americas where wars between indigenous peoples and colonial powers were avoided or long delayed might include large areas of the boreal forest and tundra of what would become northern Canada and Alaska, the deserts of the Great Basin, and even the depths of the Amazon rainforest. As some of you may already be thinking, though, there is a complication here. In spite of this distance and the geography involved, there was at least one major war between Tlingit and invading colonizers, the Russian Empire. The Russian Empire fought a war with Tlingit clans, as seen in the battles of Sitka in 1802 and 1804, and there were armed conflicts between Tlingit and Russians that occurred throughout the time that the Russian-American company attempted to colonize Tlingit Ani from the 1790s up to the 1860s. However, many historians do argue that distance and its impact on the logistics of the Russian-American company was a key factor leading to the sale of Russian America to the United States. And perhaps Russians would have used more violence to take firmer control of Tlingit Ani had it been more accessible to them. In any case, ultimately, this argument is that geography was the key factor in why there was no major war between Tlingit and Americans, not Tlingit and Russians. And the circumstances differed greatly between the aims of these colonial powers and the eras in which they claimed Tlingit Ani. So at this point, I'll conclude this argument uh, addressing the geographic explanation by posing my first counterfactual question. 
what if, starting at least two or three centuries ago, Shinga Ani was magically relocated somewhere further south, such as just off the coast of the lands now called Washington, Oregon, or California. Those lands saw massive waves of American settlement in the mid-19th century, and they also saw numerous wars fought and genocidal violence perpetrated against indigenous nations there by American settlers, the US federal government, and territorial and state governments. Yeah, you have a question. Oh, I'll keep going. I'm a teacher, I'm used to seeing hands. <laughs> Asking a question like this might seem ridiculous, since, of course, it is not possible to relocate a geographic region, and perhaps the Sangit would not truly be Sangit as we know them if their homeland was located anywhere else. Some scholars would reject this question as going beyond the bounds of appropriate, realistic, counterfactual thinking. However, there are other scholars that believe artificial but imaginative scenarios like this might have the power to spark important inquiries. So if we examine the history of the Pomo, the Yurok, the Nisqually, or numerous other indigenous nations of the Pacific coast and consider the wars that they fought with Americans in the late 19th century, we might conclude that the Tlingit would have been just as likely to go to war had they lived in that same locale and had their lands been just as accessible to American settlers. Such a conclusion may help emphasize the importance of geography in this history and may even lead you to believe it was a determinative factor. The second explanation is not that merely Tlingit lived a great distance away from would-be colonizers or that their lands were geographically inaccessible, but rather it was the environment of Tlingit Ani and the natural resources present there that made European and American mass settlement less attractive and made Tlingit labor more valuable, therefore easing relations and decreasing the likelihood of war. Russians and Americans alike discovered quickly that the lands they claimed in this region were and are not conducive to the types of farming that would-be settlers would have wanted to transplant here. Farming difficulties hampered the Russian-American company and limited the attractiveness of the region to American settlers, who in many other areas of the continent, again, as in lands uh, now called Washington, Oregon, or California, rushed to seize indigenous lands in order to establish American-style agriculture. The most significant resources that eventually led to some American migration into Tlingit Ani by the late 19th century were gold and fish. It's arguable that the exploitation of both of these resources did not require significant numbers of American settlers to come into the region. Uh, nor did it even require the taking of most Tlingit lands. Instead, American companies desired to use Tlingit labor in both the mining and fishing industries, and in some cases cooperated or found compromises with Tlingit leaders and clans in staking mining claims and operating canneries. There were no large deposits of placer gold in the lands that would become Southeast Alaska. And it was those types of deposits that brought in the greatest numbers of prospectors, such as in California or the Klondike. And I'll apologize to our um, guests from Doc Hawk Kwan, because I know very little about that history of the Klondike and uh, the Tlingit that live in the area now called Yukon across the border. Um, so I have not included any further information about that, but as we think about coastal Tlingit'ani, the largest gold deposits needed to be extracted from the ore through hard rock mining, which was not accessible for large numbers of independent American miners. Instead, the Treadwell mine uh, on Douglas Island, for example, employed Tlingit, among others, as wage laborers in the mine. As for fishing, 
There were certainly tensions and many conflicts that occurred as American canneries and fishermen began to exploit Thingit fishing sites, which were and are at U clan property. However, some canneries did agree to pay clans for the use of this at U, at least for a time, and many Thingit men and women agreed to supply fish or work as processors for the canneries. The growing industry also did not fundamentally threaten Thingit survival through destroying the people's food resources, at least not at first, at least not until salmon stocks and Thingit Ani began crashing decades later in the 20th century. We could make a comparison here between this history of resource exploitation and the history of the destruction of bison populations on the Great Plains, the rapid killing off of bison by American hunters is usually judged to have been a key factor in the wars fought between the United States and numerous indigenous nations on the plains. Would the Thingit have turned to war if their salmon resources had been threatened more gravely and more immediately? So I'll lay out multiple counterfactuals here, um, some of which I just alluded to in order to conclude this argument about the environment and natural resources um, decreasing the likelihood of major war in Thinga Ani. What if Thinga territory was better suited to European and American style agriculture? Would that have resulted in mass migration of would-be farmers and conflicts leading to war as Thinga lands were overtaken and seized by settlers? What if there was more readily available gold in Thinga Ani? Would that have led to disastrous violence with white prospectors overrunning the region, as happened in other places throughout US history, like uh, Georgia or California? Or what if Americans had posed a greater, more immediate threat to salmon runs? Would such a sudden and dangerous threat to the Thinga way of life have sparked a major organized violent response? If you reach the conclusion to one or more of these questions that war would have been more likely, then the environment and the resources of Thinga Ani must have played a role in how this history developed. We now turn away from these broad geographic and environmental explanations toward a more strictly political one. In this explanation, it was a lack of unity among the Thingit, namely the strong independence of Thingit clans that prevented them from launching organized resistance to the United States. When the US purchased Russia's claim to most of Thingit Ani in 1867, the foundation of Thingit political structure was approximately 60 different independent clans, all of which made their own political decisions. In the past, clans had formed alliances to fight major wars against colonial invaders, such as in the First Battle of Sitka in 1802. There are scholars who still discuss and debate how many clans were part of that alliance, but we know that there was a coalition. While there is evidence that at least some Thingit leaders wanted to resist and wage war when US forces arrived, they did not manage to form a coalition that could realistically challenge the Americans. Looking at other examples from North American history, from Tecumseh's Confederacy to Red Cloud's alliance of Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, we see that indigenous leaders did wage major wars to protect their people's interests when they were able to form large coalitions. In Thinga Ani, however, the clans of different areas encountered and interacted with Americans at different times and in different ways. And there were few moments or few triggers that could have united many of them all at once to launch organized violent resistance. Here I'll pose two counterfactuals. The first more fanciful and the second more realistic. First, what if Thinga Ani had been politically unified. I call this question fanciful because the independence of clans lies at the root of the Thinga way of life 
and it seems highly unlikely that a single clan or leader could have created some sort of centralized Tlingit state. However, we can look to examples of other indigenous nations, like the Comanche or the Lakota, who possessed quite decentralized political structures, but still unified their grand strategic actions for some time in the 19th century, and found great success fighting surrounding groups, including would-be invaders. Still, it does not seem inevitable that even a more centralized Tlingit nation would have gone to war against the United States. The Kingdom of Hawaii, for example. Um, Hawaii was a unified indigenous state, but its power was slowly eroded and co-opted before its seizure by Americans, and no major war occurred as part of that colonial takeover. The more realistic counterfactual to ask may be, what if more clans had shared a sense of urgency and interest in driving the US military from Thinga'ani and had faith that they could form an alliance that would be successful? Perhaps the obvious answer to that question is, yes, if those conditions had been in place, then it seems uh, very likely that Thinga'ani clans could have decided to wage war. The more difficult and interesting follow-up question would be, what could have created those conditions? Perhaps if the US military had been more aggressive and had built more forts and brought more soldiers to Tlingit'ani, or if many more American settlers had arrived at once and all begun violating Tlingit laws across the region, that could have sparked a stronger reaction from more clans. Instead, the piecemeal disorganized nature of US military policy and the slow arrival of American settlers may have dampened the kinds of sparks that led to war elsewhere across North American history. In the final argument I'll offer today, I focus on those specific conflicts and reactions in this history of Tlingit American relations in the late 19th century. Regardless of how far geographic, environmental, or political explanations go, it is easy to point to numerous situations in which Tlingit and Americans came into conflict with each other as the US government and American settlers made attempts and eventually succeeded in colonizing Tlingit lands. We must bear in mind that the US military patrolled Tlingit waters, attempted to impose new laws regulating the Tlingit way of life, interfered in inter and intra-clan affairs, and protected Americans who themselves exploited Tlingit people and broke Tlingit laws. In many of these instances, where one side or both violated the expectations, norms, or laws of the other, such conflict could have led to violence. And when it did lead to violence, that violence could have developed into war. However, Tlingit clans and individuals often chose to compromise on their legal principles and even sought out American officials to mediate disputes in order to avoid greater conflict. In addition, certain US military and civilian officials showed at least some willingness and flexibility to accept some elements of Tlingit law. The exceptions to this, where there were large violent conflicts, stand out as occasions when US officials, military officers, refused to recognize Tlingit claims or accept a compromise, or when they chose to collectively punish Tlingit communities. Even in these instances, Tlingit clans and individuals continually decided to avoid violence and seek peace, including declining to launch responses to the attacks from the US military. There is evidence that certain individuals and clans did want to react with more violence on various occasions, but the lack of support from fellow clan members or potential allies from other clans led to these plans failing to materialize. One of the most striking examples of this dynamic that I know of is alluded to in a reference made in a US Army report from February 1869. And there it is from the, the Fort Wrangell Post letter book in the National Archives. The context 
briefly summarized is, is the lead up to the so-called cake war, if you are familiar with that history. Um, so that context is that two men of the cake Khan or cake people had been killed at Sitka by an American sentry. And after the American commander there refused to pay compensation for these deaths, a cake Khan leader killed two American trappers in order to at least partially restore the balance. Those balance killings were reported to the U.S. military through Taoyat, a leader in the Shtakin Kwan, as part of this report. And Taoyat stated in this report that, quote, propositions had been made to him by the Kik Kwan in presence of the Shitka Kwan to form a league for the purpose of destroying all the American military posts within the department. That proposal was then rejected by the leader Tao Yat. And within days of that report reaching the US officers in Sitka, the sloop of war, the USS Saginaw, was dispatched to destroy Kik Kwan villages as collective punishment for the death of the Americans. With advance warning of the ship's approach, Kik Kwan clans met to determine their response, and they ultimately decided to retreat from their communities and hide in order to save their people. So in January and February of the year 1869 alone, there were multiple instances where Tlingit leaders could have chosen to engage in a major war against the United States. What if Taoyat or other Shtakin Kwan leaders had been more receptive to forming a coalition? And what if they had chosen not to pass on information to the Americans? What if the Kik Kwan clans had decided to confront the USS Saginaw, even if their odds of success were low? There were undoubtedly many meetings and conversations Tlingit had in the late 19th century about how they might resist the forces colonizing their homeland and their lives. In every case, however, they ultimately chose means of resistance other than war. Determining the causes of historical events is often a difficult task, and determining why something didn't happen in history is even trickier. I do not have a single definitive answer as to why Shingit never fought a major war against the United States. However, I do hope that in presenting these several different possible answers, I can help spark thought and discussion about the most important factors that determined or affected that history. Factors that might have included geography, natural resources, politics, compromises, and individual choices. In hearing the arguments for the significance of these factors, there may be one or more factors that seem more determinative to you than the others, or your final answer may be all of the above, and you can conclude that all of these factors, and potentially others I failed to mention, were significant. Other explanations might include the devastating impacts of epidemic diseases on the Thinget population, how that affected clan's ability or desire to wage war, or could include the shifts in US federal policy in the late 19th century, in which the US federal government turned away from treaty making and creating reservations. Personally, I find that all four of the explanations I outlined in my presentation, the geographic, the environmental, the political, and the individual, all are all relevant to at least some degree. However, I do think it's critical to state that I do not believe in geographic or environmental determinism, that such factors made certain historical outcomes inevitable. Instead, I do believe that history is dependent on contingencies and that even very small acts, choices, and seemingly random occurrences can affect the outcomes of major events in our past. It seems difficult to argue that the decisions of the governments and individuals involved in this history, including Klan governments, the US government, and other Tlingit and American leaders, did not make an enormous difference. Tlingit were active peace seekers and peacemakers during the late 19th century. In the words of Ned Blackhawk, they held visions of peace, even in extremely difficult circumstances 
when their lands were invaded, their laws were ignored, and their communities were under attack. And I am certain that further research is bound to reveal more occasions where brave individuals intervened to prevent greater tragedies, and I look forward to hearing those stories. Regardless of your conclusions about the biggest causal factors behind the lack of a major war occurring between Thinget and the United States, what's ultimately most critical for us to do is to thoughtfully engage with and strive to understand Hashagun, our history, and to consider the most important lessons we can draw from that history. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, Please feel encouraged to email me if you have any feedback or if you'd like to be in touch. Here are my sources, and uh, please let me know what questions you have with the time we have left. I'd love to hear them. Goodness, cheese. If I don't hear any questions, I'll start a class discussion. So I think the question is the uh, Treaty of Session, the agreement between Russia and the United States in 1867, did that agreement impact the United States in not being concerned about seizing the land right away? Is that a fair? Well, we know that that agreement allowed, recognized that people had the land, and so the United States did not think they, wish, they had it all. They had to. I think that most people in the federal government at that time did not recognize any indigenous land claims and assumed that with that treaty, it was suddenly part of the United States. But I think there could be a, a good argument and something to research further about maybe the, the geopolitical pressures and how threatened the United States felt at that time um, you know, two years after the Civil War, if the United States felt very secure with their land claims, um, there were four forts, I believe, established across Alaska within a year. Um, you know, of course, the U.S. military um, took over the garrison at Sitka, but then I believe there were three other forts established. Um, but it may be, as I mentioned, the U.S. military was not extremely intent on suddenly occupying all of Alaska right away, so that might have reduced the pressure that may have been there with the chances for conflict. We've got time, so if you wanted to discuss among yourselves, the obvious question would be, uh, what factors do you think were most significant? I'd love to hear everybody else's conclusions. Question? Um, well, kind of. Uh, uh, I, so a while back, I came across the Lynn Blockman 
Yeah, I think I might have read that before too. That's a great point. Yeah, so um, just, yeah, no, I, I really think that that had a lot to do with it too, is just how we viewed the people that were coming to our land. I just had a, a comment, which is a lot of, um, when we look at like health equities and health disparities, a lot of what we do is look at like the time of contact. And so I wonder if like you look at it from that, you know, sort of time of contact point of view as well um, and compare it, maybe that would give you another lens to look through. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. One of the one of the explanations I was considering listing that I never ended up figuring I had a good way of phrasing was just a, about timing, right? So there is an there's an argument, um, for example, from the late historian Ted Hinckley about uh, the timing of contact with Europeans and Americans and then the timing of the United States making these colonial claims and imposing um, colonization. And his argument, his suggestion is that there was that long lag time between the time of the fur trade in the late 1700s, early 1800s, leading up to then the late 1800s colonization, and that maybe that lag time and that timing allowed Tlingit all this time to adjust and understand their situation. Your mind is a little bit like a steel trap. It's really interesting listening to you go through these mm -hmm. questions. So at the very end, you said that the kind of people tend to be more peaceful, interested more in peacemaking. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Goodness change for your comment. I, you know, I'm I'm not sure that it's my place or that I have the the evidence to to say that Thinget would be greater peacemakers or more peaceful than any other indigenous nation across North America. Um, that could be possible, um, but. I do, I do think that the circumstances in which all of these different indigenous nations uh, encountered uh, colonialism, they did differ in these uh, sometimes subtle and sometimes extreme ways. And so it's still a lingering question that I have not answered <laughs> why the Thinga experience was different than those other indigenous nations that did fight large wars. Yeah, that's that's a good question. I I think you know, uh, looking at those connected events in 1869, for example, from Sitka to the cake, the cake communities to uh, Kachana Ak, as was explained in the presentation this morning about the bombardment of Wrangell, there are multiple examples there just within a short period of time of different Tlingit leaders making those choices in times of extreme duress that they would stand down from the conflict and be the ones to either give themselves up to the US military that was seeking to arrest them or to step away from the conflict when the US military was threatening bombardment. So there are many individuals there whose actions should be highlighted. I just wasn't able to get into that detail. That's a great point too. Yeah. And that's where I would go back to we weren't they weren't being pushed onto reservations because of the purchase of name. Yeah, and that's another completely legitimate argument about that change in US federal policy and such that the US federal government was not seeking to place different Alaska Native peoples onto reservations at that time. 
especially early on, they had to work to kind of unify clans within this new identity of we are the A and B. We have this Kadena Ha we wear, and it's, I, I know there's some sensitivities about the kind of assimilation pressures that early A and B sought because they wanted to be able to fight the U.S. government, basically, for land claims. So they did eventually, they did unify in that way in the 20th century across clans, and, mm -hmm. and really became a uh, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to to make a metaphor, you could say they unified and then waged a, a successful legal war, a legal battle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would, um, I, I guess, challenge your claim that history is not a science. Like, I understand that it's not an empirical science in the sense that, you know, you can't have an experiment to kind of, like, verify your hypothesis, but you can you know, look at past events to look at general trends in a way that, you know, is scientific, even though we use that word very narrowly in English, uh, such as, you know, she suggested that you can look at the rest of, of Alaska to compare how there were no major wars between indigenous tribes here in the United States, and as opposed to comparing to if it were in another part of the country. And I mean, I, I, I guess that is a, a rather that, that is the way that in, in history you kind of verify hypotheses, even though you can go back in time and the answer. Yeah, there could be a whole long discussion I, I about whether history is a science or not. I, I, I follow on I, I fall on the not a science side, but again, that that that's going to be totally dependent on your definition of science, I guess. So. I guess I feel like when I think of war, I think of these major, you know, there's lots of people on one side, lots of people on this side. But when I listen to like the Henry Denny tapes of 1964, and he talks about, we think of these wars as these big wars that happen. But I don't know if necessarily I feel like, when he explains, he says, we, you know, we think of them as these huge things, but a war in between clans could have taken years. And I mean, I can't imagine like like the, the war between, I guess maybe the, the Sanyas and the, the people up here in canoes, it would take a long time to plan it. Shamans would be involved, warriors would be involved in, in just canoeing around in these areas in major, or big canoes, small canoes and all the, the, the environment and the demographics in this area. And so then I think when he explains about the war, he says, you know, it, sometimes it wasn't necessarily a, a huge one. It was like 10 people mm -hmm. when they warred and that was a big war oh. and it changed, you know, um, how they, I guess the, I guess maybe like even the cake, the, the, where there was two people killed and that was retaliation, they probably thought that was ser it was really serious and it really was serious and that was probably a huge war to them where like when Henry Denny talks about the war with other clans and quans, 10 people to 20 <coughs> people was huge. Because I think it is huge because our clan people individually are huge and important in themselves by themselves individually. That is a great point, yeah. Goodness change. Yeah. They they may very well have perceived that then as as a war and me coming here and saying, Oh, there was no major war, that may be totally disconnected from how they would have thought about that. Goodness cheese. Goodness cheese to the cut you Han, I think we're out of time, but I uh, appreciate your attention. I welcome any other questions later.